of areas. Uh, I'm from the School of Visual Arts in New York. Hi to everybody, if I um, have met you or haven't met you. I'll jump right into the paper here. Uh, the first image I'm looking at is this image from a manuscript that we'll be focusing on today. It's from, it's called the Maastricht Hours. Uh, it's from the city of Maastricht, which is in the Flanders. Uh, it was made at around, in around 1320. And what you see here on the margin of one of the pages is a monkey sitting beneath a tree, and it's spinning thread. It's pulling thread out of the historiated initial and weaving with it. The, the red line wound around the distaff is rising and falling in ornate loops, and it turns into the decorative extensions of the initial, which reads, Ave tu qui ne pas fêteur, mais tu criant ta créature. Hail to you who are not made, but all, every being is your creature. So drawing matter from these words, the simian is gesturing for that which is fêteur, that which is made. The decorated and populated parchments of Snow 17, which is what this manuscript is called, stitched together into a leather binding. Also called the Maastricht Hours, this book's folios measure only 9.5 by 7 centimeters, so it's about the size of an iPhone screen. But its margins are a vivid and interdisciplinary study in material thought, spun from the central text as a form of sensorial exegesis and imaginative association. Monkeys and Apes had been appearing a lot in marginal art of European cathedrals, manuscripts, tapestries, and objects in Northern Europe around the 11th and 12th century. At the time, the word simia it also came to be used as a metaphor in Latin and literature, often in relation to art and alchemy. An early example comes from a 12th century theologian, Alan Gleal, who once wrote, Oh, the novel miracles of painting. What can have no real existence comes into being and painting the ape of reality, Simia Berry, diverting itself with a new art, turns the shadows of things into things, and changes every lie into truth. So my research is about the possibility that some European, Romanesque, and Gothic ape imagery is inflected with questions and concerns about the nature of art, or material imagination, or making things, or that it performs ideas about materiality, like you see here. <clears throat> Uh, Michael Camille was one of the first who posed this idea in his book, Image on the Edge, The Margins of Medieval Art. He wrote that the ape came to signify the dubious status of representation itself, le songe being an anagram for Lucine, the sign. However, Camille didn't really provide support for the anagram, and he didn't develop the idea beyond a few observations. Art historian H.W. Jansen's earlier exhaustive study, Apes and Ape Lore in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, had argued that the ape was visualized as a metaphor for art in 16th century sculpture and painting, so think Michelangelo forward, but uh, that before that it didn't appear. He said such personifications developed only after the fine arts had established their claim to a new and more dignified station. His chapter on the subject neglects any consideration of earlier medieval tapestry, uh, manuscripts, and cathedral sculpture, and in a separate chapter on this kind of art, he said that a study of the text is apt to be fruitless since drolleries, these images in the margins, have no illustrative function. So that's what he assumed. I'm going to try to debunk that today. Uh, while the study of marginal art has expanded greatly, Jensen's views, these periodized views, uh, still really influence the subject of the ape's meaning and symbology. So I want to begin by noting three aspects of the medieval experience of apes and monkeys. One is that they were associated with performance culture. They were often kept by performers on leashes. You see a few images from manuscripts here. Uh, they're made to do the handstands and tricks. They're actually still used like this a lot in many parts of the world. <coughs> they were imported from the North African migrate coast. Uh, the Barbary macaque, it was formerly called the Barbary ape, would have been the most common one seen in medieval Europe. And this is what it looks like. It has no tail. Um, there are many of them around the rock of Gibraltar here. And they were brought across the Mediterranean trade routes. Medieval commentators often repeatedly expressed confusion or ambivalence about how to categorize simians. So this is a really important point, I think. They didn't really know whether they were animals with kind of human reason, because they were very smart, or if they were sort of human-like 
creatures with, uh, that had been demoted to animal status. And Sto 17, the book that we're looking at, is a book of hours. Um, it contains the Office of the Virgin, the Office of the Dead, Penitential Psalms, um, except not the usual Torah and New Testament excerpts. It was intended for private use, like many books of hours that it was created at the commission of a woman, uh, in this case, from the city of Maastricht, who, when we don't know her identity now. The book itself acts almost as a catalog of 14th century textile culture. It has, oh, sorry, this is, um, these are some images of the commissioner, the woman who owned the manuscript showing devotion before uh, a cross, kneeling and praying. Um, the image acts almost as a catalog of 14th century textile culture. Here's an ape spinning uh, on, a hand, on a seated loom below the month of March in the calendar of feast days. <laughs> the uh, horned sheep right here, zodiac sign for Aries, uh, is foreshadowing a much later image in which the ape in the margin of below is preparing to sacrifice the sheep in symbolic imitation of Christ being beaten right before being crucified. The ape here on folio 133b is spinning thread right next to the line in minus to us, command the spirit to man into thy hands I can my spirit, a song that was believed to be uh, quoted by Jesus in his final moments. On folio 242b, another monkey dressed as a woman is waving below the lines, my life is cut off as by a weaver. In this way, the visual motifs of Stowe 17 disappear and reappear like thread lines. They have their own memory, which becomes part of their meaning as you go through the book. The thread motif also alludes to the three fates of Greek mythology, Clotho, Lachesis, and the Tropos, with their spool of life-giving thread, measuring rod, and abhorred scissors, as Felton described them. Several later works, including this monumental tapestry, where you see a little ape in the lower left-hand corner, show that the monkey continues to be associated with this trope. Medieval commentators often had a low opinion of apes. The famous Cistercian abbot Bernard of Clairvaux described them as filthy. Theologian Hugh of St. Victor referred to them as most vile and detestable, adding disapprovingly that clerics like to keep apes in their house and display them in their windows so that they impress the passing rabble with the glory of their possessions. So there was kind of a um, denouncing, but oh, it's an ape, it's a kind of a rarity uh, tone about them. One root of the word simian, according to 13th century vestures, was the Greek simos, which meant ugly or snub-nosed. For Augustine, the physical ugliness of apes had been a reminder of human ugliness in comparison with God's beauty. That the ape demonstrates such a truth is connected for the Latin hermeneutic to its status as a monstrum, an evil omen from which we also get the words to show, monstrar in Spanish, or demonstrate. In Gothic sculpture and manuscripts, apes become quite literally demonstrative, often exposing themselves and pointing their bums at other figures or the viewer. An early 14th century choir stall in Cologne Cathedral contains two mooning monkeys in the margins of a scene of Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. In the 12th century French capital, now at the Cloisters Museum in New York, the lower half of the squatting monkey has been reversed so that though it faces forward, it's a pair of rounded buttocks that confront the passerby. Such reflexivity appears throughout medieval rape imagery. As in this scene from the 13th century Northumberland Mystery of Adam naming the animals, in which the monkey turns and faces straight toward the viewer with a sly little grin. Like the returned great gaze, exposure may be used to break through the self-contained space of art and directly confront the expectations of the viewer. There's a political as well as aesthetic dimension to exposure, which could raise comparisons with artists of recent decades, like Karen Finley and Linda Banglis, who wielded representations of their bodies smeared with pseudo excrement and adjusted by a 10 inch dildo, respectively, against an art world that extolled the male dominated aesthetic of abstract minimalism. In a scene from the 1989 video Blind Country, Mike Kelly overlays geometric shapes with his bum pointed at the camera, as if to de-school their high-minded narratives. The Gorilla Girls, 
famously continue to don guerrilla masks in their confrontation of the structural prejudices of art world power. The use of guerrilla masks, according to the group, arose simply from a spelling error, although it's worth noting that other feminist theorists like Donna Haraway uh, have also used simian avatars to subvert gender representations and reclaim or throw back the notions of women's bodies as imitations. While traditional art historians like Jansen either ignore the erotic undertones and playful penetrations of Monty imagery, or use medieval patriarchal commentary to reduce them to symbols of folly and base sexuality, scholars of recent decades like Mary Carruthers have explored the associative and mnemonic functions of marginal imagery in ways that, put, that push their meanings beyond the um, simplistic moralist, moralized readings. Stowe 17 often shows itself to be less concerned with didactic function in the imagery than with associative impact and mnemonic value. On this, in this image, for instance, a monkey in the body page makes recorded music into the bum of another trumpeting monkey, setting up the text on the next folio that describes those who have the joyfulness of God in their throats. A monkey on folio 202b is pointing its bum in the direction of what seems to be an elaborate personification of thought. Up there in the, in the upper left, it's a um, crowned head with wings grown from the temples, out of which a woman arises, and she's blowing a bubble from the end of a strand of hair. The first line of text on this page is from Job 720. Why hast thou set me contrary to thee? This monkey seems to play a diminutive messenger of death, mocking human consciousness, maybe. Maybe it performs a contrarium of the narrator's thoughts which drift toward a fantasy of disappearance by falling asleep in the dust. One notable thing about these last two examples is the way that the simians' bums are drawn. This is a little detail, and bear with me, um, because it seems uh, obscure at first, but it's actually really interesting, I think. So we see them drawn from the side, um, but we see the crack visible, even though the, we, the view is a profile. Most monkey bums of Stowe 17 share this flattened almost hieroglyphic quality, as do many of the other late 13th and early 14th century Northern European manuscripts. The feature is unique to the monkey. It doesn't appear, for instance, on this guy, who's also showing his bum. <laughs> it may be wrapped up in the aggregate of jokes in European culture around monkey bums, which in several instances are used to pun on the Latin cule, which means bum, embedded somewhere in the words of a nearby text. And here I have a couple examples. These hieroglyphs resemble the open book itself, with its smooth, rounded surfaces that disappear into the binding. Monkeys, more than any other marginal figure, are represented as creatures of the book, as in the common motifs of apes reading, naughty student monkeys in a classroom. The monkey often doubles as scribe or illuminator. Here's another one where a scribe on the left margin is repeated 50 pages later by a monkey doing the same thing writing on a tablet, and then there's another one. The monkey's pictogrammatic bum stands out in a figure that otherwise tends to change constantly, assuming disguises, switching genders, contorting its body like an acrobat. Oddly, this special feature even finds a distant parallel in the monkey king, Sun Wukong, of the Chinese epic Journey to the West, who is capable of 72 kinds of bodily transformations with the exception that his red bum and monkey tail resist being easily changed or hidden. So at one point, while he's attempting to escape Air Lang, uh, he changes into a roadside shrine, except that he turns his tail into a flagpole, and Air Lang recognizes that it's a breach of custom. Flagpoles belong in the front of shrines, so he recognizes that it's Wukong uh, disguised as a, as a shrine. This is from a Chinese television um, 2011 adaptation of that journey, uh, journey to the West. The apes of marginal art often represent an assimilation to excretion cycle. In a sort of sacrament turned carnival act, the monkey in the body page of folio 83b passes a fish whole into its mouth and out its anus. Fish were symbols of Christ and the disciples in the early Greek speaking church and in foundational texts like Ambrose's On the Sacraments. In monastic and devotional culture, ruminating on the Word of God, the daily bread, was often compared to ingestion and the practice of communion, of course, was at the very center of Christian worship from the beginning. It might seem improbable to us now, but that such an innocent symbol as this, the fish, would be pictured in this way in a devotional book, 
but it was actually not uncommon for marginal monkeys to play on sacramental rituals and dress as religious figures. These simians do not so much subvert religious rites as play on the devotional idea of imitatio, the disciple imitates Christ, as the likeness, the similitudo of the human existing between the categories of human and animal the monkey was a figure in which the repetitive performances and rituals of devotional life could be abstracted and vicariously reimagined. The, the portrayal of apes and monkeys is a direct lens onto European strains of anthropomorphism, misogyny, exoticism, ethnic caricature. Monkeys were often paired in degrading public spectacle with bears as parodic lovers, the latter associated with masculinity. In medieval English and Roman languages, the word she-ape came to be used for a female prostitute. Also common was the tendency to compare apes with women, and apes and women with artifice and materiality in such a way that implied that there was a weakness of character or an over-susceptibility to the affective images. And Isidore of Seville actually um, says in his Etymologiae that women, while they're pregnant, shouldn't look at apes or monsters or mm -hmm. disgusting images um, because they'll bear offspring resembling what they've seen. He believed that, uh, that a woman's nature specifically was susceptible to that kind of bodily uh, translation. The long-standing paradoxical belief um, that women are by nature more easily tricked than men and, and are themselves <laughs> is encapsulated also in Stowe 17's portrayal of the fall of man, with man as quiet bystander while Eve is deceived by a woman servant. This is taken as a virtual beginning for the chaos and monstrosities represented in the, in the margins. Incidentally, the same image on the opposite folio has been a little bit rubbed out, which makes you wonder what the reader thought of it. Stowe 17 goes on to ridicule masculine constructs as well. Um, nobody's really safe from the marginal uh, humor and satire. But um, it ultimately reinforces themes of courtly conduct, devotional study, and a woman's role from childbearing to funeral arrangements. As a recurring character, the monkey's identity is also in constant transition, representing both male and female, deployed in a wide range of parodies. Oh, sorry, here's another image of a woman lancing a knight. Um, the illuminator of uh, sorry, and the ape is also used as a stand-in for ethnic outsiders. So the illuminator of Bombay 264 places apes and boars' heads in the heraldry behind the Indian king Horus' army fighting against Alexander the Great, implicating them as emblems of foreignness. You see little apes' heads up here in the blazons. <coughs> in Stowe 17, the illuminator exploits a reference to strangers and the people of the Ethiopians from the nearby text for an exoticized portrayal of three monkeys, two performing and one riding an elephant. On folio 205b, the cartoonish genitals of a monkey hang down as it raises sword and shield toward what scholar Sarah Lipton identifies as a caricature of a Jew, who is accusing God of hiding thy face and thinking he thy enemy. The use of monkey costumes also appears in later uh, records of racialized performance in 15th century Flanders. Of course, it connects to a much longer history of racial caricature in Western art. One does find scattered points of similarity and influence between the monkeys of medieval Europe and other traditions. But these kinds of comparisons often highlight underlying cultural differences. For, instances, for instance, the conventional description of the ape in bestiaries that we looked at that drew on the Greek word samos, snub-nosed, has a parallel in the name of the Hindu monkey god, Hanuman, which translates literally in Sanskrit as disfigured jaw. However, Hanuman's disfiguration involved a story told about his youth in which he tried to steal the sun and eat it, mistaking it for a ripe fruit. Hanuman also is a complex and empathetic character. He goes on to play a heroic role in the epic Ramayana. While in European tradition, the simian's prominent facial feature is more often reduced to caricature and blithe wordplay, as in Chaucer's description of Simkin in the Reeves tale, round was his face and turned up was his nose, as child as an ape was his skull. In conclusion, the Simians of medieval Europe are harbingers from the spiritual and geographic fringes of the world. 
Beyond a few fables and remnants of classical mythology, um, there's very little unlucky protagonists or complex fictional personas. If at times they're shown climbing a tree or sitting on a branch, it's usually a ready-made tree or folkloric or iconic import, or the acanthus branch of classical ornamentation. In other words, they're fragments. They're disconnected from, from habitat, from, their, from narrative, and a sense of pathos. They came to inhabit the anxious world of European identity formation. With their imitative performance, though, they mirrored a culture back upon itself, creating the potential for reflexive thought, thought about material imagination, thought about art, thought about what it means to be an imitation of something else. Within the wide and varied field of late medieval marginal imagery, looking at the way the age acts, acts as a metaphor for art becomes a channel for the cultural, cultural dynamics and material imaginations that produce perceptions and representations. It allows us to reflect on what Alan of Leo called the novel miracles and shadows of our own arts. Thank you. Century Scotland Blood Bagpipes and Theater. Um, and it's kind of in, um, the start of what could be potentially more research of understanding why um, there's not a lot of uh, well known Scottish playwrights during, during the 16th century. Um, okay. So, as you know, the 16th century delivered many of the greatest works of all time in theater history. We have Christopher Marlowe and uh, William Shakespeare that were kind of the most well-known playwrights at the time. Um, in 1606, Shakespeare wrote Macbeth, which brings the audience not to Verona or Padua, but to Scotland, which is a place that doesn't get much recognition during, uh, from the theater during this period. Uh, and why is that? Why does um, Scotland seem to always fly under the radar, and how does England always manage to outshine the small yet robust nation of Scotland? Uh, there are many reasons as to why Scotland um, didn't, did not make a big of a splash as England did in the 16th century theater. Um, only one play um, from before the Reformation has been recovered, and it belongs to Sir David Lindsay, um, who is perhaps the most well-known Scottish playwright um, from this century, and I, I believe um, of all time. Um, his play, A Satire of the Three Estates, was a direct commentary of life in Scotland and was first performed publicly in 1552 at the Linlithgow Palace. The play was only performed twice in Lindsay's lifetime, um, but has since been a staple in Scottish theatre. So Scottish theater was greatly influenced by the social, political, religious, and geographical struggles during the 16th century. And a satire of the three estates is a strong commentary on the daily lives of the people of Scotland. So mid-16th century Scotland was, wasn't the easiest time to live in. Not poverty was abundant and sickness was everywhere. Um, the politics of the country absolutely shaped the lives of everyone um, in the country and hugely influenced the lasting impression that Scotland left behind. Um, who was in power, how quickly power moved from one ruler to the other, their relationship with England, the laws that were in, were into, were in effect, and how the country viewed its own government, um, can all tell us about the you know, political state uh, of Scotland during that time. Um, the presence of the church deeply affected the way people viewed plays and the subject matter that were, that were in the plays. Um, the religion that was happening in Scotland, the, the tension between, between the religions, who some of the religious leaders were and how many churches there were in Scotland can also um, kind of give us a better understanding um, of how much the church and religion affected Scottish playwrights during the time and how they responded to it. Um, also, the location of Scotland and the layout of the land, I believe, had a, had a greatly had a big impact on um, the way that people lived and, and, indeed, and indeed how plays um, were um, were written and how how plays. Uh, why they didn't spread, I guess, why people didn't go see the theater. So analyzing these four areas can give us a better uh, understanding of the matters that affected Scottish plays in the 16th century. Um, so I want to just explain uh, this, uh, the play that we're going to mostly be talking, talking about today. So it's the Satire of the Three Estates by Sir David Lindsay. Um, it was written in Middle Scots. It centers on a young king who was advised by his counselors to take a mistress. 
He is fooled by three courtiers who send good counsel to jail to gain more control over the king. Meanwhile, the king forgets about his true principles of Christianity um, as different vices, such as flattery, falsehood, and deceit, disguise themselves as a friar, a monk, and a priest. They send the poor and needy away because it does not help their position, and they are afraid of the danger it could bring them. The king is advised to call upon all of the estates for counsel. Um, the second part of the play centers on John the Commonwealth, who represents human dignity, revealing the failures of the estates. And the play ends with the three vices, falsehood, deceit, and flattery being, being hanged. Okay, so let's dive into um, the social aspect. So the Scottish life was, um, did not always leave time or means to visit the theater. Um, the mortality, mortality rates were extremely high, um, and life expectancy was about 40 at that time. The population was between 500,000 and 700,000 people um, in 1500, um, and it should be noted that there wasn't an actual official national population survey in Scotland until the year 1775, so that also kind of tells you kind of um, where they were at at that time. Um, noblemen or lords, gentry and tenants made the main social classes, so the noblemen or lords were landowners, the gentry acted as middle class, and the tenants were the farmers. And around 1553, a law passed that required requiring every person um, possessed of 100 lands to 100 pound lands to plant orchards for three acres around their residence. And tenors, tenants were obliged to plant one tree um, for every bird land which they rented. And agriculture was the largest contribution to the Scottish economy, and the majority of the people. A majority of the population lived in and lived in very rural, rural areas, and whole families were involved in agriculture. Uh, many Scots struggled to survive and were challenged by harvest failures, famine, plague, and other uh, epidemic diseases. However, Scotland kinship structure remained strong throughout um, the, the entire century. Um, kindred was widely interpreted, but in, influenced all levels of social structure from the highest nobility down to the poorest. And the, the, the nobility had the highest, um, had the greatest wealth and power in Scotland at the time, but their numbers were considerably low compared to the population. Now, Sir David Lindsay was a member of court under James the under James the Fourth. Um, and attended St. Andrews University. He was a very educated man, and he was even knighted in 1529. Uh, so the satire was originally uh, performed before the Royal Court in Melithga. Um, the target audience was contemporary society. So it was the corruption of the king's counselors, the dishonesty of the craftsmen, and the superstition and greed found in all sections of the church. Um, and the play voiced a passionate appeal for the reform of the Scottish church. So, uh, with Lindsay being so involved in um, politics and the struggles between the church and the state, it's no wonder that they consider this play a political parable. So, politics in Scotland, Scotland, um, like most places during this time, was, was extremely complicated, complex, and violent. Um, King James V ruled Scotland from 1513 to 1542. Um, he died while away at Salway Moss um, in a devastating loss against the English. Um, his daughter, Mary Stuart, then became um, Queen of Scots when she was eight days old. Her son, James, um, James VI of Scotland, became James I of England and reigned from 1567 to 1625. Uh, much like James IV, James V um, extended royal justice, navigating Scotland through an incredibly important time in, in its history. Um, Scotland's relationship with France became increasingly important, and on May 1st, 1544, about 10 years prior to the first public performance of a satire of the Three Estates, England declared war on Scotland. And Scotland grew closer to France during this time and modeled the Parliament after the Parliament in Paris. So the members of the Three Estates sat side by side each other in Parliament, and it was markedly different from the separate houses of Lords and Commons that happened in England. Um, Lindsay's entire play is a political allegory almost directly calling out the way politics was handled at this time. So members of the court and religious leaders who were deeply invested in the politics and the political gain of the country 
and their church were some of the people that saw this play. And the characters surrounding um, the king in the story represented religious ideals um, or leaders in the church, and this play is just as much a religious satire as it is a political one. And as I said, this was not um, written to be ignored or swept under the rug. It was a bold political statement um, that had a lot of comedy to it because it was a satire. Um, and here I just have uh, a little bit of uh, the royal uh, line. You can see Mary Queen of Scots and, and James the Scott. We can kind of get, um, show um, where uh, they kind of lied. So, religion. So, the Scottish Reformation began um, in the second half of the century. Uh, Mary, Queen of uh, Scots, Mary Stuart at the time, uh, wished to practice Catholicism like she did in France. Uh, meanwhile, leaders such as John Knox, um, and meanwhile, John Knox and other leaders in the Reformation movement had created a predominantly Calvinist national kirk, and Scottish Parliament kind of Scottish, Scottish Parliament uh, adopted the rejection of papal jurisdiction and mass in 1560. Um, so it was a difficult time in Scotland as tension grew between Catholics and Protestants, and many Scots wanted to get away from France's influence over Scotland. Um, before this, James IV um, heavily increased the religious presence across Scotland. He himself was a pretty devout Catholic who um, endowed several parish churches across Scotland, um, and they were supposed to keep an active preaching role um, especially in, in, in the local areas um, until the Reformation. And keeping the Catholic, meanwhile, keeping the Catholic presence strong. Um, during this time, crown interference in church affairs was at a level unparalleled in Scottish history. Many church leaders struggled to find any means uh, and faced many economic problems. On top of this, um, corrupt officials uh, were no doubt in abundance and eager to take advantage of any, of any situation. Um, and the corruption seeps itself into all levels of the church, but most prominent is the, in the but it was most prominent in the highest levels, um, as the one featured in the satire of the Free Estates. So, with religion being an important part of society, the plays that were being performed at this time often had religious undertones and demonstrated a Christian message. So, a satire of the Free Estates is a morality play, um, often rooted in religion. These plays offered a form of moral compass to the audience. Um, they portrayed characters that could be anyone or every man, um, and, this, and who the audience could follow on their journey to redemption. The main aspect of these um, allegorical plays often possess are characters personifying moral qualities. For instance, in the main character in Three Estates is King Humanity, and along the journey he meets Lady Sensuality, Falsehood, Flattery, Deceit, Solace, Good Counsel, Divine Corruption, and the Poor Man. Um, and that's just a few of the over 30 characters that are included in this play. Um, and the heart of the play lies within the representation of the three estates of the realm of Scotland, the bishop, the lord, and the merchant. The bishop represents the leader of spirituality, the lord represents the leader of tem temporality, and the merchant represents the leader of the burgesses, all of which characterize the clergy, the commons, and the barons, which formed parliament. Um, another interesting aspect um, is how geography played a role in, in, in Scottish theater at this time. So, the satire of the Three Estates was written in Middle Scots, um, which is a language that was popular between the 15th and 17th century. Um, Old Scots stems from the Germanic language and was used um, in the late 14th century throughout the 17th centuries. Um, in Old Scots was the dominant vernacular in Lowland Scotland, um, whereas in Highland Scotland, uh, Gaelic language was used. So they're often referred to as the Gaelic Highlands and the Anglic Lowlands. And so with language barriers, it was, it's easy to see why plays didn't necessarily move around the country so much. So if you grew up in a really small town in the Highlands, you may have, you may have spoken Gaelic. So plays written in Middle Scots or any other language um, that was used in Scotland uh, weren't necessarily the most useful to you um, unless you had a proper translation. Um, and there's also there was a distinct difference between the highlands and the lowlands that has nothing that has to do with more than just language. Um, a lot of it is um, the way that the land is laid out. Um, today, um, Scotland has over 31,000 lochs, which are lakes. Um, so most um, a significant amount of Scotland is covered in water, um, which didn't make traveling um, 
easy during that time. Um, and Scotland remained a very localized society during this era. Um, so most people would never travel very far from their home, and a lot of people re regarded the, where the area they lived as their own little, little country. Um, so they didn't necessarily move from here to there. Okay, so in Edinburgh, sorry, Edinburgh was the capital, um, and it was the most populated populated city in the, in the entire country. Um, and in 1550, the population was about 1250. Um, taking into consideration London at that exact same time is about 70,000. Um, so you can kind of see the difference there, which is about six times six times larger. Um, and Edinburgh is located about 400 miles north um, of London. So in Scotland, a lot of the plays were performed in, at the court, and there are records of performances going on at, Holly, uh, at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. Um, and one of the only other records of a performance of a satire of the Three Estates was at Greenside near Calton Hill on August 12, 1554. Um, this is almost adjacent to Holyrood Palace, and Mary of Geese, Mary uh, Stewart's mother, uh, was in attendance on that performance. And with Edinburgh being the largest city, the capital, and the location of Edinburgh Castle um, and Holyrood Palace, which is where um, the royal, um, which is where the, the royal family was, it is, it is no shock um, that that is also the central location to most most Scottish theatrical roots. The setting for the three estates takes place inside of the court entirely. Um, the first performance, like I said earlier, was in 1552 at Lilithgow Palace, which was the birthplace of Mary Stuart. Um, the play didn't. The, this play did not travel around co the country via theater troupe, like a lot of morality plays traveled around England at this time. Um, and a lot of the cities that are mentioned in the Three Estates are all in central Scotland. So they are either above the southern uplands, but below the highlands. So it's safe to say that this play and the story it told um, may have never reached the far areas of the northern highlands. And with the lack of communication between the towns during this time, and the number of poverty-stricken uh, towns, uh, people didn't necessarily flock to areas to watch performances. Um, and I have a map, you can kind of see a political map, and uh, kind of, you can see that rough terrain. Um, and even from Inverness here to um, Edinburgh, um, that's about like today, about a couple hours drive. Um, so it's, it is a small country, but at the same time, because the terrain is so um, rough and it was covered in water, and uh, a lot of travel wasn't necessarily um, happening um, for a lot of people. And I also have some pictures. So this is an example of, of a lock in Scotland. You can kind of see um, some of the terrain here, again, um, with water. And, and, and this was during the summer, especially painting during the summer. Um, again, some of the, um, some of the terrain here. Uh, now it, it froze my thing. So. Say that, yeah. Yes. Um, and this is another example um, of the terrain and then some, some, some mountains as well. Um, and this is Edinburgh. I just want to include some pictures. Um, this is kind of an example that shows uh, Old Town and New Town. Um, this is Edinburgh today. Um, this is Hollywood Palace, so this is actually the site of where um, one of the performances was at the court here. Um, so this is kind of the front of it, and you, this area right here is actually um, the chambers of uh, Mary Stewart. So that's where Mary Stewart Scots was. And then adjacent to it, um, this right here is actually a view taken from Calton Hill, where um, one, of the performance, one of the performances of, of the Three Estates was. Um, and just out of frame right here is, is Hollywood Palace. Palace right here. Um, so this is taken from the hill, and then if you go up, follow this road up there, you go to um, Edinburgh Castle um, up the Royal Mile. Okay. So a complete version of the play was not printed until 1602, so nearly 50 years after the very first performance. Um, the like I said earlier, this play is the only full play recovered after the Reformation in Scotland, and therefore holds a substantial place in Scottish history. Um, 
There are many reasons as to why you know English drama is so much better, so much more well known and recognized than Scottish drama. However, recent history has produced a lot of many talented, uh, many, many talented Scottish playwrights. Sir David Lindsay's *A Satire of the Three Estates* was clearly greatly influenced and by all means written because of the life surrounding the Scottish people. So, looking at the social, political, religious, and geographical aspects of the 16th century in Scotland gives one a deeper understanding of not only the significance of *A Satire of the Three Estates* but the mindset of the people seeing the plays that were performed. Thank you. Incest, the word that modern humans almost whisper or hiss if we say it out loud at all, outside legal or clinical spheres. It awakens the most primal fears of physical and mental injury, or perhaps even worse, the insult of betrayal of trust by those closest to us. Modern definitions, whether in Anglo or Hispanic worlds, focus on those distancing from emotion spheres. Now, I can't resist adding that the PowerPoint that you're not seeing uh, and this is, was sort of an aside to semi-lighten the mood, or at least point up some linguistic differences. Uh, the color scheme of my PowerPoint presentation reflects a cultural difference between the Anglo and Hispanic world's cultural baggage uh, about colors. For example, in English, we talk about blue or racy language and jokes, but in Spanish, we talk about el viejo verde, the old green guy, or dirty old man. Hence, the green PowerPoint background, since this is really about father-daughter incest. And then I would show you another slide with a number of real and literary examples. Historical examples of what modern societies call incest, if not totally accepted at the time before, in fact, sometimes even dictated by social practice in real societies, certainly not particularly punished, that is, for example, incestuous royal marriages in real societies, these uh, examples abound uh, through the ages from actual biological incest, for example, the Egyptian royal sibling marriages and European royal cousin marriages, to the non-biological, but certainly socially questioned as incest life. For example, celebrity Woody Allen's marriage to Sunyi Prebhu his common law stepdaughter, who was actually literally adopted by Alan's previous paramour and her previous husband. However, in the created societies of literature, examples of incest are not infrequently included throughout the ages, but generally as a secondary plot device for a lesser motif, per se. Early examples are dominated by the emphasis on the religious overlay. Uh, the modern examples tend to either de-emphasize the incest as literary devices or use it in protest literature. For example, among 20th century prose works written in Spanish, the Nobel Prize winning 100 Years of Solitude by the Colombian uh, Gabriel García Márquez is based on implication, if not outright details of incest, on the prophecy that a descendant of the Buendia family will eventually be born with a pig's tail uh, as a biologically recessive trait which will become dominant due to incestuous sexual relations within a family. Mexican writer Inés Arredondo was one of the first 20th century feminist generation writers in Latin America to emphasize the abuse factor of incest in her short story, The Shunamite although obviously it's a takeoff on the, the biblical story by the same name. So now you would see a uh, slide about uh, general anthropological definitions of incest. First, our question is, what is incest, whether it's in real life or in literature? Anthropologists define, define incest as sexual relations between humans of certain degrees of kinship which may or may not be limited to biological kinship, like the real life examples I told you about. 
So now you would see a slide about U.S. law. Uh, modern legal definitions in United States family laws, though they vary rather widely by state, focus more on defining specific prohibited uh, incestuous marriages. In many European countries, the focus is also on more detailed and centralized definitions of criminality itself, not necessarily on marriages. Now you would see a slide of Spanish modern law. In Spain, a country with an institute of women in their Ministry of Health, Social Services, and Equality for several decades, incidentally, has a modern countrywide series of laws about sexual aggression in general with emphasis on the violence and damage done by incest as a justification for criminality. And specific punishments in each case are enumerated. You would now see a slide on church teachings. As a point of comparison, given especially the centuries of Roman Catholic influence in Spain, the current teachings by a canon law by the Roman Catholic Church concerning incest, of course, talk of sin but they also focus on criminality. Now you would see a slide of uh, some verses from Leviticus. Going back in time to the Middle Ages, as we might guess, and as Elizabeth Archibald, who is arguably the best known scholar on incest in Western literature, especially in literature in Western European tradition, notes in her work of 2001, Incest and the Medieval Imagination, that real life developing legal systems reflected in the created societies of the literature of the time were based on, I quote, biblical teachings and Greco-Roman Greco law raising questions about the rationale for a system of taboos that had become so complex by the early 13th century that to avoid hardship, and I'll explain that word later, uh, the number of prohibited degrees of relationship were drastically reduced again in instance, were drastically reduced by the fourth Fort Lateran Council in 1215. But fear of inbreeding and deformity is rarely mentioned, end quote. Of course, the Western medieval understanding of genetic biology was nearly non-existent. So the cultural norm, if not the law, uh, against incest was much more based on distant human history, exemplified by the anthropologist's definition of kinship in specific societies and religion, rather than on any particular knowledge of recessive trait inbreeding, recessive trait inbreeding risks to dictate cultural exom exom I can't say this word, I never can. Exogamy, there we go. Uh, so, now you can see a slide about the incest taboo. However, as defined by the online, because I like this one, wise geek, uh, there may be an instinctual avoidance of incest. Quote, the Westermark effect is a phenomenon which has been observed in individuals who spend large amounts of time with each other under the age of six. People who are raised together, regardless of relationship, tend to become desensitized to each other, and they will not generally develop sexual attraction to each other later in life. A variety of studies have supported the concept of the Western Mark effect. This idea is sometimes referred to as reverse imprinting, and I have to tell you, this is kind of an aside. Uh, it's named for Edvard Westermark, who was a Finnish sociologist who lived and worked in, worked in the late 1800s. He was particularly interested in marriage patterns and incest taboos, uh, and is the idea that people who are raised together will not develop sexual patterns, excuse me, sexual attraction, went contrary to the beliefs of Freud, uh, the prominent, who was his prominent contemporary. But over time, and you've got to read Paul Masson if you haven't, uh, it's become apparent that Western Mark was vindicated uh, as evidence strongly suggests that Freud's ideas are not supported by actual evidence. Well, now you'd actually see some uh, portraits. Again, as Archibald continues about classical and medieval literature, the genetic consequences of inbreeding are ignored. Children of incest are usually heroic and beautiful, like Adonis, with a few exceptions, Mordred. 
uh, versus the real life results of inbreeding and recessive traits becoming uh, dominant, uh, which is obvious in portraits of later Habsburgos or Borbones in Spain. I mean, the dominant uh, overdone chin, the uh, overbite, the, all the deformities, the mental aberrations, etc. cetera. Uh, the portraits I imagine most of you have seen are uh, fairly shocking. So, uh, Emily uh, Francomano, who is specifically a scholar of Spanish literature, clarifies why the Fourth Lateran Council softened the prohibitions against incest. Quote, by the 12th century, canon law prohibited marriage between persons related by kinship to the seventh degree and between persons related by spiritual affinity to the fourth degree. The ecclesiastical definition of incest was so broad that it significantly reduced the number of eligible marriage partners, especially in small communities, where one was very likely to be related in some degree, either by blood or spiritual affinity to one's neighbors. I have to throw in here that in the little town I grew up in, all the cute boys were my cousins. So we grew up in a small town, so it continues. In any case, in the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, these severe restrictions were somewhat relaxed. Owing to what the council recognized as undue hardship when it came to finding a permissible match, the prohibitions were reduced from seven degrees of affinity to four. To justify the prohibited degrees, the theologians explained that seven degrees reflected the seven days of creation and later, four was a logical number of degrees in relation, given the four humors of the body. Uh, the rules established by the Fourth Latin Council remained in place until the Council of Trent. Franco Mano continues, I quote, seven titulos in the siete partidos, uh, partidas, sorry, uh, that's like the seven tracks, by the medieval monarch, Alfonso X, Alfonso the, the, the Tenth, El Sabio, the Wise, discussed the, discussed the definition of incest and the legal ramifications of incestuous relationships. Alfonso follows the 13th century reduction of prohibited degrees. But royals were either routinely exempted from these degrees or their practices were ignored. So now you see in a slide of canon law at that time. A review of Archibald's book sums up what frequently surprises readers of modern literature, though not necessarily surprises scholars of medieval Renaissance literature, that incest was, I quote, a remarkably frequent theme in medieval literature. It occurs in a wide range of genres, including romances, those are the, the story poems, uh, saints live and exempla. Historically, the church in the later Middle Ages was very concerned about the uh, about breaches of the complex complex laws against incest, which were defined very broadly at the time to cover family relationships outside the nuclear family and also spiritual relationships <coughs> through baptism. Medieval writers accepted that incestuous desire was a widespread phenomenon among women as well as men. They're surprisingly open about incest, though of course they disapprove of it. Uh, in many exemplary stories, incest is, is identified with original sin, uh, but the moral emphasizes the importance of contrition and the availability of grace to even such heinous sinners. As in the two probably very late medieval or early Renaissance anonymous poems examined in this particular paper, the aforementioned Silvana was a strolling and Delgadina. Archibald observes that, quote, father-daughter incest is a disturbingly popular motif in medieval literature. It is the most common of incest in extended medieval narratives. Brief exemplary versions usually involve consummated incest and the father dies daily. Incest seems an ever present danger in medieval literature, though it can be absolved by repentance and grace. 
So now you'd see a picture of this book, The Divine Views. The Flores really ought to pay me a percentage since I've used it in so many classes and I tell so many people about this series of books, bilingual books, uh, French, German, uh, Spanish, Italian, Hebrew, that have protest poems by women. In any case, so one of a series of collected poems uh, from other language traditions, translators Angel and Kate Flores, The Defiant Muse, Hispanic Feminist Poems from the Middle Ages to the Present, offers both Spanish and English versions of these two poems. Possibly truncated or otherwise incomplete, the poem about Silvana features only the implication of father-daughter incest, as Silvana's avoidance of saying and suffering as a result, and it's so short I'm just going to point to it. Silvana goes a stroll. Silvana goes a strolling uh, along her upstairs hall. Uh, if she sings well, she dances better, reciting ballads best of all. Uh, from a lookout point, her father keeps his eye affixed upon her. Daughter Silvana, how well you look in your everyday attire. Better than queen your mother. Out and all her finery. Because Silvana does not care to, she's imprisoned without water. One day, looking out a window, she spies her two small brothers playing at dueling one another. For God's sake, I beg of you, my brother, bring to me a glass of water before I die of thirst. My soul to God, I would give first. A few scholars have suggested that the incest threat implied in this poem may not be consanguineous uh, because due to so many maternal deaths and childbirth at the time, a factor in multiply married royal fathers, Silvana could be the king's stepdaughter, which somewhat mitigates the church disapproval and I suspect uh, horror on the part of uh, modern scholars. However, the considerably longer and more complete poem while still highlighting Delgadina's suffering as a result of her father's incestuous desire, is overt. The father sorts, now come, my Delgadina, for you must lie with me. And she refuses. Neither the Lord of heaven nor our most sovereign lady wishes that I should lie when the father would be got me. Which says biological. Delgadina, like Silvana, is imprisoned as a result of her refusal to comply. Adding the titular insult to injury, she begs her mother for water, echoing Silvana in the earlier poem. My mother, because you're my mother, bring me water. I'm dying of thirst. I want to give my soul to God. But her mother definitively refuses, telling her, be quiet, bitch of a daughter. Be quiet. You're to blame. For seven years, I've known the shame of a bad marriage. Similarly, Delgadina's sisters and brothers so refuse upon fear of death for aiding her in her resistance. While Delgadina finally seems to ver verbally capitulate to her father in exchange for water, she's found dead in its blood. Around her bed, a ring of blessed angels stood. And following the pattern set by Archibald for the father dying dam, the poem ends. The bed of the king, her father, was crowned with a ring of fiends. George D. Greenia is one of the only few scholars of Spanish literature who focus on incest, along with some other modern American scholars, notably Aaron Irene Mann, Emily C. Franco-Mano, and Sara J. Portnoy, who are all very young entering scholars. Rather than, uh, these people focus rather than on early literature in English, French, Italian, and German, and others. Rinia notes that many of well, the most prominent tales from the Iberian Middle Ages contain incest themes that are, while possibly nearly threatened, narrowly averted, or fully completed. The Iberian tradition seems to reflect the general European tradition amply do documented by Elizabeth Archibald that ranks father-daughter incest the most reprehensible. Greenia adds, any examination of the literary landscape of a period needs to check itself against the religious ideals of its times and the legal injunctions that tried to channel human conduct. 
Both of their currents are surveyed by authors in this cluster. Brian, Paul Brian Nelson, uh, Teresa Catarera, Catareja, and I use the Latin American there, and Luis Baspari. Uh, but there's far more work to be done on all fronts. Relevant passages from, again, Los Siete Partidas, uh, the first proto laws in Spain, and Alfonso X, and other law codes of the period reveal some of the legal reflections of the period, but many other sources still need to be considered. Working mostly from municipal cha uh, charters, Heath Diller points out repeatedly the control that fathers routinely exercised over their daughters' sexual fates, also expressed in the Sagothic Law and in the Fuero Cusco uh, as his potetas de conjunción, uh, or nearly absolute right to decide his daughter's marriage and therefore her sexual partner. Lacking the father's content, the daughter was punished severely for elopement by disinheritance or worse, and the unapproved husband could be outlawed as an abductor. Such intimate authority could slip into dominance or blackmail, extort extorting for himself, that is the father, the favors of a girl that she could not grant to anyone else, a la delgadina. So, to bring this project back to the semi-present and into Latin America, Pena calls attention to traditional folk tales, mostly gathered after the medieval period, during the post-Romantic era, and even more insistently during the rise of systematic ethnographic fieldwork carried out at the end of the 19th century and throughout the 20th. Uh, they also document many stories of incest. There is a modern prosified version of Delgadina, which was adapted from a ballad source. And from Puerto Rico, we have the story of Los Tres Traques, which is father-daughter incest, temporarily thwarted by obstacles invented by the girl who then flees from her perverse suitor. So bringing the long history of real and literary incest out into the open, saying the word aloud, uh, outside legal and clinical distancing spheres, examining the real practices and their literary representations, whatever the cultural or linguistic circumstances, brings those primal fears of physical and mental injury and the worst insult of betrayal of trust by those closest to us into the light for the healing, frankly, of real life things. Thank you.